Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Welcome to the Bay Area Book Festival's program. It's titled America in the Time of Fentanyl and Meth, Sam Quinones' Chronicle of a Crisis. A reminder to everyone, please silence your phones or anything that might make bells and whistles or chimes so it doesn't interrupt our conversation. Thank you so much. Um, an introduction of myself, I'm Cecilia Lay. I host and produce the San Francisco Chronicle's daily news podcast, Fifth and Mission. I'm joined today by author and journalist Sam Quinones. He's a former LA Times reporter and an author of three acclaimed books, including the bestseller, Dreamland, The True Tale of America's Opiate Epidemic. And today we're gonna to talk about his latest book, The Least of Us, True Tales of America and Hope in the Time of Fentanyl and Meth, which really picks up where Dreamland left off and really hones in on how powerful and uh, deadly synthetic drugs are and how they're changing our communities. A reminder that there's going to be a book signing by Sam after the event at 345 in the Sausalito Books by the Bay Tent in the park. Um, I first just want to applaud everyone for coming here. This is not an easy topic. If anyone tunes into the news, we hear about fentanyl all the time. We know it's a big problem, so thank you so much. And Sam's going to help us make sense of what's going on here in the streets of San Francisco, in the Bay Area, and really cities across the country. Um, there is a lot of ground to cover, Sam, so let's get into right. it. Yes. Great. By the way, thanks for doing this. Of course. Appreciate it. Of course. So I, I host uh, Fifth Emission, the San Francisco Chronicle's daily news podcast, and I would say probably every week there's at least one or two stories that we're doing on fentanyl or something related to sure. the opioid crisis. And maybe this is, I would like to start with maybe a little bit of a selfish question, but you know, as a journalist, trying to make sense of everything that's going on and understanding what's happening, uh, what's your sense of how newsrooms are covering it? And what do you think your book, what kind of gaps in understanding, what context does your book provide? Well, I think, um, first of all, thanks to you all for showing up, coming out today. Appreciate it. Um, I would say that there does not seem to be a, uh, there's a, a lot of coverage of the daily blood and guts, so to speak, mm -hmm. people dying, um, that you're finding fentanyl in, in lots of different uh, uh, drugs now. There does not seem to be um, a, a much about the larger story of why mm -hmm. that's happening. What are the changes down in Mexico? This is primarily a trafficker-driven phenomenon, doesn't have much to do with, with demand. Uh, no, no heroin addict ever demanded fentanyl. Mm -hmm. it not, it's not possible to uh, imagine that. Um, and we can talk about why that is. Um, but this is not a demand-driven story, this is a supply-driven story. And why is that? Why are we finding so much of it? It's almost like traffickers or dealers really have taken to using it the same way we use um, salt on a salad or something, you know, just throw it into any damn thing now. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what makes it very, very, um, very scary, very, very, very dangerous. I would say that, the, that by and large, it, it, what is not being told is the larger story about why this is happening and also the remarkable fact that unlike in other drugs that are plant-based, this is a synthetic drug made only from chemicals, meaning you can make it all year round if you have access to those chemicals, which they do through these ports uh, down on the Pacific coast of Mexico. If you have that, you can make it all year round and in quantities that boggle the mind. And what, this is, what is also happening is that I don't quite think is covered as much as it should be. Mm -hmm is that this is a national story. This is happening everywhere. The same story is happening everywhere. You're finding cocaine, fentanyl laced into cocaine everywhere in the country. It's not, used to be that, that when I was coming up, I'm 63, so when I was coming up, uh, you know, uh, in my early adult years, you would have different drug stories depending on where you were in the country. Mm -hmm. And now that's still the same, it's still the, the case to some small degree, but mostly it's the same story. I was just, I've been in North Carolina, Vermont, um, uh, Ohio, uh, where else? Um, oh, Idaho, t 
talking to a bunch of narcotics agents from all over the Northwest, they all see the same story. There's no difference, it's that, and that has to do with this just colossal supply flooding in um, from Mexico. So it's putting all those pieces together that I think people could do a far better job. Why are people putting fentanyl that'll kill you mm -hmm. into cocaine to potentially kill a customer. Mm -hmm. you know, we're not getting those answers in the, in the, in the daily media that, the way I think we, we, we ought to to make sense of all this. Right. And part of, I remember we chatted before this conversation, and you said fentanyl ha specifically has completely changed the way we think about treatment, about managing the crisis. Yes. Um, and say a little bit more about the fact that this is a synthetic production versus yes. plant-based. Right. Say more about how that really changes the way we think about even solutions. Yes, and I, I would say that that's the essence of what's going on um, here. Uh, so the, the trafficking world down in Mexico, and again, this all is rooted in, in what they see and also what local dealers see, because all across the drug trafficking world, from down to the smallest level, everybody knows lottery-sized profits from fentanyl. Mm -hmm. that's, what the, that's in the mind of every single person. Um, but this began, it, it, you know, when the, traf when the drug trafficking world f was forming in Mexico in the 60s and 70s, all the people there, most of the, 90% of the people there were farmers. They were connected to the land. Ranchers in Sinaloa, Nayarit, in Michoacan, places like that, right? And um, now their grandchildren, so to speak, are now seeing that the real profits are in chemical-based, synthetic drugs. Why? Well, you, you, know, you don't need land mm -hmm. anymore. You don't need sunshine, irrigation, rain. You don't need a very large contingent of farmers to harvest your drug for you. You can do it in a lab far away from the helicopters. The only thing you need is um, ports and ports, shipping ports, because ports allow you access to um, the uh, um, uh, world chemical markets, China and India, pre pre predominantly, mostly China, but India is now coming on uh, pretty strong. And, um, and so, and what's more, you can make it, as I said, year round. There's no more seasons. Mm -hmm. Marijuana and poppies, they all obey a kind of a season. You, can't, you can make this stuff all year round. And um, in the case of fentanyl, um, it's, it's so potent that a very small amount will render a huge profits for just about anybody. And that's kind of what first got people going. People on, on, on the web began to get, see ads from Chinese chemical companies able to sell you, send you through the mails, a pound of fentanyl. A pound of fentanyl is, you know, will make, well, generally speaking, if it'll take a 50 to one cut, so 50 pounds of saleable product. The way people will avidly line up to buy your product, even though it's been cut 50 times. Never in the history of drugs has that ever happened right. on the streets of the country. So the ports allows for this scale of production. Right, and impunity in Mexico, obviously right. corruption in Mexico. And I would say this too, an important other element in this is our guns mm. um, going south. We, are arm we have armed for 50 plus years um, with the guns that are bought fairly easily here are smuggled south into Mexico. That's what ensures the impunity mm -hmm. of those guys to be able to make all, those, all that, dope. sorry. No, it's good, but also one thing that your book points out is that um, once the chemicals are here, it becomes very accessible for anyone yes. to, to, to make and produce the drug. So I want to read this really quick passage that illustrates that because you spotlight this time in 2014, I think you called it the start of like the fentanyl gold rush. Right. And the reason why it was a gold rush was because people could use the magic bullet blender to really produce a mass it. quantity fentanyl. So uh, it says, still fentanyl spread. It did so because it was the drug underworld's great democratizer, and the magic bullet was some part of that. A more complicated, expensive, hard to find mixing machine might have deterred many of these new fentanyl dealers. Instead, the magic bullet was cheap, 
$29.95 at any Target, Walmart, or Best Buy. Its very name seemed to promise a solution to all of one's problems. It enclosed the mixture in a plastic bulb. You didn't need to use an open bowl from which you might inhale the product's dust. Each dealer appeared to imagine that this tiny appliance was not only great for making smoothies and salsa, but also all he needed to rake in from millions from a synthetic substitute for heroin. So right. that scene even illustrates the scale of the problem. Right, and also the fact, the other issue was that they saw lottery-sized profits promised to them by fentanyl, but in order to get it for the first time really in the drug underworld's history, mm -hmm. they now have to mix it with something because fentanyl is so potent you get a few grains of worth of, of fentanyl will get you high, another couple will kill you. And so, but you can't sell a few grains on the street. It's just not, not feasible, not logistically possible. So you need to mix it with inert powder. So how do you mix it? Well, initially, many of them took to using the magic bullet blenders. You see them on infomercials, they're sold from Target, and, and as I said. But what, what that meant also was that, that the, 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 behind all that was the idea that fentanyl was now creating an enormous new swath of like new kingpins. Mm -hmm. You didn't be, need to be connected up to a cartel to be a kingpin to sell what were had been kingpin-like quantities. Mm -hmm. You could just get it from the over the over the web. They send it to you in the mail. You mix it up. You sell it. You know, and and uh, you don't. The problem is, of course, what we saw early on in the fentanyl thing story was that there was. Um, you know, these clusters of overdoses. You saw the Cincinnati, I remember one weekend had 70. Huntington, West Virginia had like 50. Um, and that was due to the awful mixes made possible by the Magic Bullet Blend. Because Magic Bullet Blend, we own one. Magnificent little machine. You know, it, you make your smoothies and your salsa and all the rest. It's fantastic. But it's not the way you want to mix your fentanyl. Right? In fact, it doesn't mix powders. It's got a blade. Blades don't mix powders. You mix powders by tumbling. You don't mix powders by liquids mixed with, with, with a blade. But the myth spread. And so that's why you got this awful, awful mix. Now, this is a few years before it hit California. Mm -hmm. It really hit first in the, in the, town, in the cities and, and the states, really, where they were worst hit by the opioid ep epidemic. Ohio, West Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee, Indiana, places mm -hmm. like that. And that's, that's where the first narcotics agents began busting these mix labs and seeing. And one guy sent me this picture. We see them all the time, he said, and they sent me this picture. It's like six dusty, unclean, messy looking mm -hmm. magic bullet blenders, which the guys have been using to mix their, mix large amounts of fentanyl. And that, those mixes were so bad that some people wouldn't get high and other people would drop dead right, right, right from the start, right. you know, immediately. Right. And the other thing about synthetic drugs, of course, other than just the scale of the devastation, sure. is that it's connected to a lot of the other issues that we're seeing. And you point out in your book, homelessness, yes, uh, tent encampments. Right. Say a little bit more about that. Well, I think that fentanyl and the, the other story that goes along with this is the story of methamphetamine. Um, methamphetamine was how the Mexican cartel world learned about the benefits of synthetic drugs. They mastered methamphetamine back in the 90s, sold it in, in, in and it was a method using a precursor chemical known as ephedrine, which you've all known probably in the Sudafed pills, it's a, de a decongestant, right? And, um, and, and very common. And, um, and so down in Mexico, they, they mastered this, and it was a very, very easy method to master. And it got a, a whole big, region of the country used to making meth, a lot of people trained in how to make meth, and also kind of aware first of the synthetic benefits to them of synthetic drugs, no land, all that stuff that I mentioned um, earlier. Uh, and, and, and so then along, they, they were completely unaware of fentanyl until 2006 when um, an element of the Sinaloa drug cartel funded an amateur or underground chemist to make them ephedrine because they were afraid the government was going to crack down, they wouldn't have it. Um, so he, he's from Mexico, lived in San Diego, learned to cook there, got arrested, prison, came back, was deported, and they contact him in 2004, we'll fund a lab, we want you to make ephedrine. But he 
I talked to the guys who, the DEA agents who interviewed him, and they said he was like this guy who thought he was the smartest guy in the room. So he says, no, I'm not going to make ephedrine. I'm not going to tell them. I'm just going to make fentanyl. And, you know, when they found out that he had done that, they got mad because they didn't have a clue what fentanyl was until he sits them down and says, look, again, this is the most potent, profitable drug you will ever encounter. And I'm going to make it, and I'm making it, and it will take a 50 to 1 cut, as I said. And from then on, that's when the lights go on in the Mexican drug world that there's a synthetic form of heroin. And they already know about synthetics because they've already been producing meth. Meanwhile, meth changes because the meth Mexican government does put controls on ephedrine. Pretty soon they can't get enough of it. They switch to another way of making it that's really new to them. It's an old way made by the biker gangs here and the stuff that was used in Altamont during the Rolling Stones concert that you guys saw perhaps in the, 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 the 1969. Uh, they, make, they begin making this stuff, this new way of making it uses a precursor called P2P, phenyl 2 propanone. This stuff um, is, uh, has one benefit and one benefit only over ephedrine, and that is that you can make it, make a, a, a P2P with many, many different chemical hacks, dem different chemical combinations of um, industrial, legal, widely available chemicals. So the switching to this new method means that they can now make more product than they have ever, ever even been able to conceive mm -hmm. before. And that's what begins to happen, particularly in 2000, begins in 2009, but about 2012, 13, 14, you begin to see these vast quantities of meth, P2P meth now, swat, uh, flood the country, and it ends up in the Midwest in about 2017, and New England in about 2019. But the story has another angle to it that I found out very late in writing The Least of Us, and that was that this meth also is accompanied by very rapid, severe onset of symptoms of schizophrenia. Very scary paranoia. Everybody's out to get you. Ephedrine meth was big in the gay community. It was a party drug. You were everybody's best friend. You're yakking it away. You always, this stuff is very sinister, turns you inward, and makes you uh, kind of afraid of everything, and also screaming at things that aren't there and all that kind of stuff. And what that begins to do, and answer your question, is it begins to create two things. One is it begins to create homelessness and mental, together with mental illness, people can't live with you anymore. You're very quickly thrown out of places you could be living. And, and, and then uh, and the, as this goes across the country, that you begin to see this real rise in homelessness and then tent encampments. But it also, what it also does is even if you weren't rendered homeless by methamphetamine, once you are homeless and you, this meth is so prevalent and so cheap, so frequently it's just free. If you're a woman on the street, it's free. You're going to pay in different ways, but it's free, basically. And so you begin to see this, this um, uh, uh, just these, this transformation of our homeless problem away from being people who were mainly affected by maybe economic issues towards people who are now affected mainly by mental illness and, and addiction together, impossible almost to untangle yeah. that. And then, of course, uh, tent encampments. Tent encampments are perfect places if you are uh, afflicted by mental illness and, and uh, um, meth-induced psychosis because, first of all, the, the tent allows you to little bulb in which you can hide from the world. It's now a threat. But also, you, you don't want to be away from the dope, you know. And so, meth, meth, uh, tent, I call them meth encampments. Tent encampments um, are places where you can always, you're always around people who are using, it's like an enormous cheers bar, you know, where everybody knows your nickname. Now, it's, it's, and, and also it's a place where, and you're finding this, and we're seeing this all across the country, and I know you're seeing this in San Francisco, it's a place where you are on graphic display, you are seeing the extent to which these drugs, particularly of abuse, will squelch, suppress, whatever the verb is you want to use, our basic instincts for survival. So people will be offered housing, they'll be offered treatment, they'll be offered warmth, whatever, warming centers, whatever it is, and they will turn it down. People freezing to death. You see these in, in other places where the, the weather turns particularly bad. And so my reporting um, for this book has convinced me that, that 
a, tr a major driving force, let's put it that way, certainly not the only thing, but it's a major driving force in our homelessness, mental illness, addiction, and, and tent encampments mm -hmm. is this methamphetamine that has been coming out of Mexico really in vast quantities since 2012, 13, 14, right yeah. there. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it'd be a surprise to anyone to know that there's a link there between synthetic drug addiction and homelessness. It's also a tough conversation to have, though, right, because everyone here knows the Bay Area is so expensive. It's unlivable, right? The Chronicle right. has done stories about various profiles of homeless people. And, you know, we did a story where we found many people in Oakland who are homeless were previous homeowners. So it's sort of a hard conversation. How do we thoughtfully bring in issues of drug addiction without generalizing the homelessness? Price, well, I think, right? I mean, I don't know if, I don't know. To me, it feels like um, the only way to get to good policy is to not shrink mm -hmm. from um, uh, reality. And I, I, I have to say, um, you know, I was just having breakfast with three, um, with, I'm sorry, two uh, paramedics in San Francisco who, you know, or graphic in their description of what they see every day for now years. Um, one has been working there since the 90s. Another about eight, seven, eight years, you know. This one woman said, um, I think uh, this is, um, you know, it's like you can almost kind of predict it. Uh, the meth is never exactly the same. This is, using meth now is not like you buy a can of Coca-Cola in LA and buy one in Atlanta and it's, almost, it's the same stuff. Mm -hmm. This is, meth is made different, different with different chemicals, maybe in Nayarit, then it's made in Jalisco, then it's made in Sinaloa, then it's made in Michoacan. So you have to compare them. But she said, you know, you get these, these, these weeks where you'll get people who, you know, oh, it's, it's like the meth that makes everybody masturbate in public is here now. Or it's the meth that makes everybody try to touch parts of their body that they literally can't touch with, with their arms. Mm -hmm. So you see these people doing this a lot and trying to unzip themselves, kind of, that kind of thing. Um, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's meth that has people raving at the demons now, is, you know, that, that kind of thing. The, you know, there's this, uh, she said, um, uh, actually both of them were talking about this, we bring water bottles to our calls. Uh, oh, another meth is, is the peop that has people out there um, emptying the trash, look, looking to hoard, find stuff to hoard. You know, and if you look at tent encampments, they are graphic displays of that. What don't you find in a, in a, a guy's, you know, you'll see like mirrors and um, office chairs. And the big one, of course, is, um, you probably have seen, the big thing that, that every, it seems like all these folks, well, a lot of folks uh, hoard, is um, uh, uh, bicycles. Mm -hmm. right? Bicycles are the perfect thing for you because uh, if you're on the stuff, because for a few reasons. One, you can rip off a bicycle and no cop will pay any attention to it. And there's just no for enforcement of that law. Number two, it's, it's a perfect thing if you have no car, most people don't, to travel around, you know, and, and particularly at night when you're all, you know, when you're all wired. And, and um, you can trade them for dope. And the, the other thing is that this is a, a, a form of method that, or accompanied by chemicals that, that create this, one of the two, I'm not sure yet, um, where you get stuck, which is a verb to, that means, and very common in the meth world, where you just get obsessed with doing one thing for hours. And one woman told me she spent eight hours with her cu cuticles. Some people spend hours and hours uh, coloring books. And, and, um, but, but mostly getting stuck involves working on a machine that you think needs fixing. And, and, you can, and so bicycles are perfect for that. And so you've developed what it, in essence amount to a street illegal bike shop. I've seen this all over LA. I'm not sure about here. I haven't been up here so much lately. But, but all of this is kind of part of what um, is the most vivid, graphic, visible display yeah. of the homeless problem that affects us all. And of course, the tent encampments, very quickly because they are filled with vulnerable people, have become vectors of the worst of human behavior. Pimping, beating, and of course, you're already malnourished and living in filth, but there's a remarkable exploitation uh, going on in those, in those little tents. You're illustrating the challenges that synthetic drugs uh, pose yeah. to you know, getting people into treatment. But even if someone goes into treatment and they recover, you also illustrate in your book that the 
the, the challenges still exist. You spoke of to course. this woman, Kirsten from Oregon. Right. She was a recovering addict of the P2P yes, meth right. that you described. Barking like a dog at one point. People thought she was schizophrenic, yep. um, but she gets off the drug and she describes the way her brain has changed. Yes. So there's these long lasting effects that are also unseen. Can you say more about that? Yes, too? certainly. And I was just talking about that with these paramedics that they, they have seen people um, who they know just haven't used in a few days and they're still um, essentially psychotic, talking to, vo talking to people that don't exist and, and on and on. And that is part of the problem that we don't know enough about, mm -hmm. honestly, about this, this, this form. Uh, there's this method of making methamphetamine and what it produces, the, the result of it all. Um, but you, you find, yes, that, that, um, that, first of all, as you said, it's indistinguish, indistinguishable from schizophrenia. Very many people I talked to in reporting this book said, we cannot figure it out. In fact, I spoke with a, a drug, a, tell the difference between organic schizophrenia and meth-induced mm -hmm. schizophrenia. One, one guy in, in, in Virginia told me, in southern Virginia, because um, I talked to people all over the country, uh, wanted to see as many places as I could where this was going on. And, and he said that we, we are now using up all of our resources meant for people who are organically mentally ill, yeah. but really it's, it's being used by people who are um, psychotic due to meth-induced meth psychosis, really. Mm -hmm. And, and, and the, the story that um, Kirsten told was heartbreaking and poignant, she said, I've been sober six months, mm -hmm. and I was in sober living. And so I walk in one night to my, um, to my, uh, uh, um, with my, my roommates in the room, and she's watching TV. And she's watching this kind of corny rom-com by Jennifer Lopez called Made in Manhattan. You know, I think it's with Matthew McConaughey, something like that. Anyway, okay. it's like this kind of good, dopey, you know, rom-com. And she sits there, this was six months into her treatment, and begins to just weep. She weeps and weeps, she says, because, out of happiness, because for the first time in six months without using dope, it's the first time she's actually felt empathy for another human being. It's these characters on the show. It's just a remark. Hey there, Monet, I didn't see you. I'm sorry. I'm a friend of mine from high school. Sorry about that. Um, and um, uh, it, it, she, she, she's never, and it, it's just, it's, but it was this great moment she never forgot mm -hmm. because it meant that there was hope. Like she could finally, she was beginning, her brain was beginning to heal, but that was six months after stopping using. And she told me two years, I, I interviewed her when she'd been sober two years. Mm -hmm. And she said, I really wish they would do some, do some research to find out other things I can do because I've, I've been trying meditation, I've been doing yoga, all of that's great, but I need, the, I, I'm doing that stuff and I can still feel that my brain is not yet healed. Yeah. Yeah. It's a powerful, powerful story. And one of those things when I was a reporter, it's breathtaking. I feel like I'm um, almost like, you know, like not worthy to be hearing stuff like that. It's yeah. weird, but yeah. I, I just, it, it was, I never, I walked around my office like, holy shit, man, this is, you know, mm -hmm. kind of like, oh my God, I just can't believe I had this conversation. Yeah, the know. long tail. The long the tail, the, the poignancy yeah. of it, mm -hmm. the, the plaintive way in which she ended the conversation was just, I hope they'll do some research so that we know other things to help our brain heal, our brains heal, because I'm doing all the stuff they tell me to. I'm med meditating daily, I'm in yoga, and I still know, I still know that my brain has not healed. I can still feel that it's not right yet. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I want to talk about harm reduction. Uh, it's an approach that a lot of different city leaders are trying. It's an empathetic approach. Harm reduction is trying to prevent the bad outcomes of drug addiction, like drug overdose. We see it here in the Bay Area. If you go into um, a bathroom of your trendy bar, you'll see a little case of fentanyl testing strips. Um, San Francisco opened a linkage center in the Tenderloin, which is the epicenter of the fentanyl crisis. Uh, last fiscal year, San Francisco budgeted over $70 million for treatment and overdose prevention programs. What are your thoughts on harm reduction efforts? Does it, can it, meet the scale I, of I do not believe, I think the evidence shows that I, do not, I, I, don't, I don't think it, um, it can do anything alone. Mm -hmm. it, it, the problem is 
we need to get people from st off the stuff off the streets and off and away from dope. First of all, there's no, there's no, the idea is with harm reduction that at some point people will have an epiphany and say, I'm ready for treatment, I'm going to go to a treatment center. Mm -hmm. And we have seen that even at the risk of frostbite and freezing to death, people will not do that. You will not, you, it, it just too rare. What's, what, what is far more likely to happen is that those people will die from fentanyl overdose or be driven mad by methamphetamine or a combination of one of those two long before any readiness can, readiness is essential if you wanna succeed in treatment. But, but how to develop readiness, we have seen that being in a tent encampment in particular is an absolute impediment to developing what I would consult, c c c say is, is, is a readiness for, for drug treatment. Rather, in the real world, people develop readiness for treatment by being nudged. It's a slow, pro and not an epiphany like, hallelujah, here I am. Sometimes, sometimes, but really mostly that's not the way it happens. It's like this nudging. You take someone, and you, to, for that to happen, you need to move people, separate people from the dope, and you need to move them slowly away from the dope. And for that to happen, we need law enforcement. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that law enforcement is like a, 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 a phrase that people are, um, are, particularly in the Bay Area, are particularly um, uh, 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 aggressively, I would say, sometimes um, want to fight against. I would tell you this, that um, there is no solution without the leverage over this dope that law enforcement provides. You will not find a way of getting people away from off the street and away from the dope that they can't then return to because you just say, here, here's, here's some treatment for you. Check into this treatment center. I've met many people who have done this. They all run back to the tent encampment. It's like you need a way of saying, here you are, you're staying here until you purge, until you detox, get all that crud out of you, until you begin to see life a little bit differently. And, this is, and, and I believe arresting people for minor stuff is actually the compassionate thing to do. Because when you do that, you then remove them from a place where they will, they will die. There's, it's not like a debatable point anymore, and we're seeing this in, in the numbers. Now, in order for that to really happen, I think, effectively, what we need to do, and I, this is the reason why in three chapters on the book about a county in Kentucky, mm -hmm. um, and Kentucky is a leader in all this, by the way, there's rethinking jail. Now, this is extraordinarily important. Jail up to now has been a net, net it's a waste of time. It's, it's, you sit, you watch Judge Judy, mm -hmm. you, you, know, you, you play poker, you sleep, you watch Judge Judy again. There's nothing, it's a place, a parking lot for people to vegetate. What I think needs to happen, and in certain counties in the areas where opioids are, have long been a problem, the counties are experimenting. They see the importance of rethinking jail, which has never been rethought. You know, I spoke to a county, a whole com a, a, a conference of county commissioners in North Carolina recently, and I, it hit me, you know, look at Mayberry RFD with Andy Griffith, that old show from the, you know, they show the jail. They show Otis, the lovable town drunk. He's in, he's out, he's in and out. No attention paid to why he's even in there at all. We have not changed jail fundamentally since that. We still have jail the way that, that, that works. And so what you're finding in these new jails that are really thinking of new ways to take people in off the street and then provide an opportunity rather than, an, than just a, a waste of, of, of time is you find, first of all, uh, you have to opt into the, the pods, the recovery pods, as they're known. But then you make your bed. You wake up at 8 in the morning the rest, and make your bed. The rest of the day is filled with anger management classes, GED classes, parenting classes, life skills classes, like how you're going to get your driver's license back, how you're going to pay your probation fine, how you're going to get your kids back, all that kind of stuff. Then you have 12-step meetings run by the inmates. It's an entire time in jail organized around recovery which has never been the case, and which is, I believe now, I, I started following this one jail in, in Kentucky in 2015, thinking it was a good idea. Fentanyl and meth have turned it into an absolutely essential thing to do if you want to save people's lives. 
harm reduction is based on the idea that you're going to use until you come to an idea that, that, you'll be, that you want treatment. The problem is you're going to die before that ever happens, or there, you're going to overdose so many times, but when you overdose, what, a definition of an overdose to, op to opioids, like, uh, something like fentanyl, is that you, know, you, you're, you're lose you lose oxygen to your brain. That's what happens. Well, every time you lose oxygen to your brain, you're creating impairment. And so after a while, there's studies now that are showing, I think, that you're finding the people who have overdosed and been Narcaned back to revival have, you know, maybe 10 times, 12, 15 times, those are not uncommon, um, have that kind of brain damage. You know, so the longer you leave people on the street to use, the more chance there's going to be people who have this brain damage who have, or, or brain damage due to methamphetamine. We need to understand that you cannot just wait for people to be, to find readiness, because they will die. But people could, would push back on that, right, and say uh -huh. law enforcement oh, sure. as a solution. You know, Mayor Lyndon Breed has, still is very adamant that there needs to be more policing in the tenderloin, and a lot of progressives have pushed back on saying that's not the way to do it, criminalizing drug oh, well, users. That's, well, here's the thing, okay? This, you know, on, on, there's two things. First, there's users, and then there's just straight-up dealers, sure. yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Now, the truth is selling fentanyl is very much like shooting a gun into a crowd. There is an extraordinarily high likelihood you're going to damage somebody and a very high likelihood someone's going to die. It's not unlike, in my opinion, if you decided you wanted to cut your cocaine with cyanide. Mm -hmm. I mean, this, the effect is, is, the, is the same. So I'm not sure how a person whose sole job is to stand around selling product that he knows, everything now has fentanyl in it, so there's no doubt, mm -hmm. he knows his, his fentanyl is somehow, is, is, that person is, is actively working to kill people. Mm -hmm. So to me it feels like manslaughter or assault or something, something like that. Um, the, and, and so I, I, my feeling on, on the whole involvement of law enforcement is our our um, entire, uh, the drug war, so-called, whatever it was, uh, to the extent it failed, it failed not because we use law enforcement. It failed because we only use law enforcement. Mm -hmm. it, drug addiction is based in the central nervous system of our brain. Mm -hmm. Any attempt to, to deal with a problem that is based in the central nervous system of our brain, that you only use one thing to ad address is is by definition going to fail. Mm -hmm. We try the same with pain. The opioid epidemic was largely because we thought pain is rooted in the central nervous system. Well, we can now cure pain, that was the idea, the myth, that by using one sole um, a, 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 a tool, and that is prescription narcotic painkillers, Vicodin, Oxycontin, all the rest. We are living with the consequences today just as we're living with the consequences of only, we need that blend Harm reduction with law enforcement, there has to be that blend. It doesn't make any sense. We don't need this. You can't arrest our way. We can't arrest our way out of it. We certainly can't treat our way out of it either. We need to blend that stuff. Each brings something to, to this mix that I think is essential. Yeah, and it, it's hard to talk about a hybrid approach when things are so polarized right now, right? It's, I'm sure it is, but yeah. the truth is this, that you cannot come to good policy if you are just deciding that no, all of this, you know, and for political reasons, you are turning away from what is the reality on the street. There, there simply is no such thing as a long-term street fentanyl user. They all die. I've known, I know, I've interviewed people who've been heroin addicts for 40 years. They don't have a good life. I would never switch places with them, but they're not dead. Fentanyl kills you. The rock bottom is death. There's no readiness for this thing. So, so leaving people on the street to do this um, is, um, I think, oh, and that's all that you do? To me, that's delusional. That's, that's, a, that's a perfect way of, of, of adding to the, the death toll, which is what we've seen. Um, it's well-intentioned. 
But the problem is when you try to deal with something that is involving the very, very complex thing called the central nervous system, which we don't fully yet understand, it's like as, as complicated as the universe. Those are the two most complicated, complex things we know. You cannot deal with it with just one approach. You need this community, uh, a widespread community of based approach. And if you don't have it, you're going to wonder why it's not working. Yeah, a multi-pronged approach. Do you yeah. have an opinion on supervised consumption sites? Chronicle columnist Heather Knight recently went to New York. It was the first city in yeah. the U.S. to open a supervised consumption site run by nonprofits, yeah. and the results seemingly seem pretty good. I mean, well, what, what are they're good. If but if you look at how many people they've revived, mm -hmm. and that's a, 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 a uh, unmitigated good that you would survive revive somebody who is about to die because that person has taken drugs that contain fentanyl and you're there with a Narcan and you you squeeze it into their nose and they revive mm -hmm. it's a miraculous looking thing when you mm -hmm. see it it's pretty incredible yeah. um, but that's not I mean people have been revived and revived and people and then died so the point is not how many revivals they're gonna make they're going to make a ton because our entire drug supply is contaminated with fentanyl. Mm -hmm. That's nationwide. That's all over the country because they can produce such quantities down in Mexico. The big question is not how many revivals you make, but the measurement ought to be how many people do you get into treatment that don't leave? Mm -hmm. That is the question. Because if all you're doing is reviving people, reviving people, People will eventually die because they're not always going to be around a, a safe injection. So I don't think we're in the business, should be in the business saying no to anything. Mm -hmm. And safe consumption or safe injection sites are one of them. Yeah. But you have to keep in mind that, that um, reviving people on Narcan is a Band-Aid for that moment. There's a, I was in Canton, Ohio one time talking with a cop. He said, in the morning, our morning shift, encounter this woman. She was ODing. We took her to the ER. They revived her, Narcan, and cut her loose. And the even afternoon shift, revived her, saw her, she was overdosing again, found her again overdosing. They revive, they revive her, take her to the ER, where they, I'm sorry, where they revive her in the ER, and then um, they kick her loose. And then the evening shift found her dead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying is that reviving people is an unmitigated, unalloyed good, but if that's all you think you're doing and you're patting yourself on the back like we're reviving people, eh, those people all will die. Yeah. It particularly, start, I want people to keep track. I mean, I've talked to people, all these people, so many folks have said, you know, yeah, I've been, you know, I've been revived eight, 10, 15 times. There's nothing, get, that, that revival is a huge red flag and, and as long as nothing's being done about that, then. Yeah. Well, I think, no matter what people think is the solution, I think what you're illustrating is that it's incredibly hard and difficult, and a single solution is not going to do. No, and it's do, also, do the right thing. I think, I th I really do believe that it's um, time to um, really look with clear eyes mm -hmm. at what is around us, yeah. and not let the political polarization of this country influence what what you're seeing. And when it comes to this, I would say it's mostly on the left that you're seeing this. There's other things we could talk about in other parts of our country where the, the right is doing the same. But, but when it comes to this, it's, it's like you have to understand that, that nobody's living through this. Nobody's living through this if, not, if they're not removed from the street. You know, that's a scary, scary thing. One thing that I really enjoyed about your book is that obviously we're talking about synthetic drug production and the way it impacts communities, but you're also not just analyzing that problem, you're kind of also examining or providing critique of American culture as well as a whole. And I want to read a passage. Uh, you have several chapters in your book on the neuroscience of drug addiction. Yeah. And here you're talking about the so social isola isolation in America, which is something, of course, many of us now understand yes. because of the pandemic. Um, you write, likewise, an addict, you were talking about social media as a form of stunted Interact, social interaction. Yes. Uh, you wrote, likewise, an addict with natural communal impulses muted devolves into an antisocial state. Her sole focus is on self-gratification, obeying her me-first impulse, isolated and alone, even as she lives amid millions of others. 
Any relationship serves her only in that so much as it can help her score. In her addicted brain, me has won the battle over us. And then you continue and say, as I traveled and spoke with neuroscientists, it seemed that one way of thinking of America in the last four decades is that we gradually surrendered, collectively as a culture, to the brain's reward pathway. Our prosperity allowed us this luxury. We could follow the nucleus accumbens and the pursuit of dopamine and pleasure. This was one way of understanding the opioid era in America. Our epidemic of opioid addiction was just an extreme expression of a culture in which, in so many ways, me won the battle over us. Yes. So when I read that, I had to. I read it a couple times. Um, it felt like to me almost like a larger thesis statement for your book. So yes, you, and I'd say I'd say that more, it began that with my my first book on the topic, Dreamland, in which I was thinking to myself, um, right, uh, that. Um, what is the root cause of a lot of this stuff, right? What is, it's not, I thought at first it was economic devastation because people said, it's Appalachia, you know, to get, go get Appalachia, the Rust Belt, and I did, and it's true, it was there. But then I found it also in Orange County, and I found it in uh, suburban, you know, Burlingame and, and uh, uh, Indianapolis and all these places that have done marvelously well mm -hmm. economically over the last 30, 40 years. So what was the common denominator? Well, it felt to me like it was our own isolation, our own shred. You know, we have this very, very necessary, essential part of our brain evolved to need, not just prize, but need community. Without community, we'd all have died millions of years ago. We'd never be here, mm -hmm. right? And in, in the last 40 years in America, we have decided that none of that really applies to us. We're exceptional, we'll, we, you know, we're, we'll, we'll go it alone from here. We don't like hanging out with other people who don't believe and look and talk and think like us. To cause a lot of taxes to create kind of community places like parks and swimming pools and all that kind of stuff. And so we're all gonna be in our, and, and it really I, it may be we are unique mm -hmm. in this country in the last 40 years, we are unique in, in that we have decided that no communal connections are really necessary, and I think that became, I mean, we talk mostly about fentanyl and meth in this book, but the truth is, the real heart and soul of the book is all these stories that I, I was writing in the book, it's half the book is really about that, right. um, of, of people in the smallest ways trying to find ways of repairing community, repairing what we've shredded and clawed away in our culture over the last 40 years, but in the very small ways because we got into the opioid epidemic because we wanted magical answers, right? We, to complicated problems. Complicated problem is, what do we do about pain? Well, the magical answer is pain pills for every, everybody, you know what I mean? And well, no, that look where that ended us yeah. up, you know? And so to me, it feels like we need we need to step away from the magic answer, from the silver bullet solution, then they'll, you know, and get back to this very small community repair work that sh you, where you show up daily and you're working in, th and you're not worried if that you're not some noble sense saving the world. You know, to me that is really, and that became the essence of the book. I mean, it really is the heart and soul of the book. So we've talked a lot about the other stuff, but to me that was really where. I started the book, and, and where my heart was throughout most of it. It was trying to tell those stories. The smaller, the better. The least sexy, the least noticed, the better, because that was my, gradual, my general point, that that's how you develop a really strong society, and that is what we have just shredded in, in a million ways we could go into for a long time mm -hmm. if we wanted to, which yeah. we don't because yeah. we've gone over time. <laughs> but. I want to leave time for questions for, for audiences. So if you have a question, please go to a festival staff person with the mic, I believe, or over here. Um, and I would ask... We do want to try to get Sam to answer as many of your questions as possible. So we request, like, please ask a question and not just make a statement or a comment. Um, and please make your questions as direct as possible yeah. to Sam. Thank you. I just want to thank you. I'm so glad. I haven't heard this before of, of the idea of um, law enforcement and not 
giving people a choice to die. Yes. Um, I was working with meth clients back in 2007, 8 in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and um, I used to tell my group, ask my group, uh, you know, if I have two clients and one of them has decided that meth is not, you know, they've had it, they've had enough, they're going to come to program, that's one, and the second one, parole officer said, um, you get to that program or your ass is going to be in jail. Which one do you think will have the most I look forward to having success with? Of course, they all say the one who wanted to come. And I said, no, I, I want the one on probation because I know, I know they'll be back. And then I had the two that yeah, told me. And I, um, and I think, you know, um, it's a good comment, uh, and I think what's happened is that the jail is um, a, a, a waste of time, except for that there are many people for whom it is the the pivotal moment. It's a pivotal moment, and and, and they are they. I've talked. I've interviewed too many people to ignore who say the most important day in my life <laughs> was when I was arrested, because it got me away from the dope in a way that I never could have uh, six, uh, done myself. And that is, I, I've heard that over and o too many times to ignore. You know, first, if one, the problem is too often jail is, is also a waste of time for a lot of people. And, and sometimes an enormous traumatic experience, too. Very often that's a problem, too. But anyway, yes, wherever. Um. And speak up, too, because I listen. When I was at Berkeley, I, I listened to way too much punk rock, and my heart, I'm very hard of hearing right now in my life, honestly. Um, my 26-year-old son died last um, August of um, meth, acute meth intoxication. I'm still trying to make sense of it in yes. different ways, and so I have a question. Um, he had been sober for about a year, and seemingly, you know, in a wonderful community and doing extremely well. Um, is it more addictive? So that's one question. Is this new meth more addictive? Because it was just seemed so unreal that he relapsed. And then my other question, um, so with this acute meth intoxication, he used too much. Yes. Um, there wasn't fentanyl in his system. Um, is there something about this new meth that makes you use more than you should? Here's the thing, and I'm not, sh I, know, I don't think we know yet. What I'm giving you, ma'am, is, um, by the way, I'm sorry about your boy. Um, um, what, what, what I'm giving you now is there's been no neuroscientific studies on this particular meth on the street to date, okay? It's just too new, and it hasn't happened. I'm hoping certainly that that's what happens. But I, I will say that the stories that you hear all across the country, almost like map one-to-one, -one, every story is the same. Part of it, it seems to me, is that the meth is so prevalent and so cheap and so available that people can do enormous damage to themselves very, very quickly and easily and have a hard time um, uh, 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 getting away from it. I'm not sure that it's more addictive than the other stuff, the ephedrine-based meth, but I do think it's, it's all about supply. It's so prevalent, so difficult to get away from once you're caught up in it that it's very difficult to, to kind of come out of it. Yeah. Okay, I have two questions. Uh, one concerns the source of fentanyl. Um, can it, is, is, does the fentanyl that used by the Mexican drug lords, are they manufacturing it or yes. are they importing it? And in either case, is there a way to cut it off, like cut off the precursor like they did the, for the ephedrine? Fentanyl, fentanyl in our country used to be made by, Ch by Chinese chemical companies and exported to dealers here in the United States who uh, bought it by the small amount, by the pound or by maybe a half kilo or whatever it was. Uh, but that changed in about 2017, 18, 19, right in there. The Mexican trafficking world began to figure out how to make it on their own. And they, sin since then they've been making it almost entirely, almost all our fentanyl is made in Mexico now and with now precursors, the ingredient chemicals coming from China, 
to, the, to Mexico who make it and then funnel it here in various, various forms, sometimes powder, sometimes in counterfeit pills that look a lot like Xanax bars and Percocets and all that. When it, the, cutting that supply off ought to be not too difficult, except for that we do not live in a world in which the United States and Mexico, for many complicated political reasons, I lived in Mexico for 10 years, and it's a long story, uh, probably too long for us to get into now, but we do not have the kind of collaboration that needs to happen to effectively, easily, I would say, fairly easily, if that collaboration were to exist, deal with these very, very toxic chemicals, but also these toxic influences, both in Mexico, which is catastrophic, this is all catastrophic for Mexico, I can tell you, having lived there, as it is ca catastrophic for us, but it has to do with corruption down there, as it does to have to do with the guns that we allow to be smuggled south that arm those guys and allow them to enjoy that impunity. Very brief answer to a very, very, very complicated topic. I can, best I can do right now. So I'm sorry, everybody. We only have time for two more questions and are already pushing it with that. Um, just a reminder that there will be a book signing. It's going to be at Alston and Milvia. Um, so if you can go over there after this, that's where that will be. So we can just do two more. I'm so sorry. Um, thank you for your work. I really appreciate I read your first book and I had you speak you. to it at an addiction conference I organized a few years ago. But today I wanted to ask a question. Um, this is challenging your, um, your statement around um, forced incarceration. Or, yes. Um, and this was in an uh, article op-ed in the New York Times about two weeks ago. Right. And it quoted uh, Dr. Nora Volkow who people are probably aware of. She's the head of NIDA. Right. She's not a big radical or anything like that. She's probably the main addiction scientist in the US. And she, here's, here's two sentence quote, and then I'll just let you comment. Um, the data does not show that it's beneficial to put someone in jail or prison or force them against their will to go into treatment. Yeah. And then she goes on to say, this is Dr. Volkow, there is absolutely no, there are absolutely instances where people um, may have had a positive outcome, um, and it then, um, but it's the minority. And then she goes on, the author of the op-ed goes on to quote some other studies in Massachusetts right. yeah. and other states. So that's all I wanted to ask right, you and what I, your I comment I can tell is. you that, that um, um, it's true that uh, the rethinking jail, so the jail becomes a place where people can, can begin recovery away from the drugs that they don't have a chance to leave, uh, and, and, and some places they don't have a chance to leave, is not a panacea. It is not a cure-all. There is no such thing as a panacea or a cure-all to what we're dealing with here. However, um, I think it, it, it is simply a, a, a logical that the more we can get people off the streets, the more people are on the streets using these, these forms of dope, that the more the damage will incur. It's the opposite of harm reduction, is when, when you think of it truthfully. I mean, that's what harm reduction is supposed to be, minimizing the harm. But people who are on the street with these drugs in such vast supply, so cheap, those, those, those drugs will create the kind of harms that we're trying to to avoid, and I think harm reductionists are trying to avoid. All I can say is to that is that I know Nora Bolkow, I've interviewed her and we were on a Zoom call together, she's a very smart woman, but I have to say that, first of all, nobody's leaving the street unless they do it involuntarily. You don't see people en masse leaving tent encampments even though they're being pimped, even though they're being beaten, even though they're risking death every single day. You don't see people le leaving that. So and my, my feeling is that we need to understand that people, the addicted brain is, is imprisoned, is captured, you know, by, the, by a dope. And, and making decisions that are contrary, they're not rational decisions. They're not decisions anybody would make who would want to stay alive and prosper and thrive. And so we need to understand that that is the situation in so many Ten Commandments all across this, this country and, and elsewhere too, not just in these encampments. So you need to find, we need to find ways of using the tools we have to pry them away from this dope that will surely kill them or drive them mad um, before it does that. So 
I don't know, to me it feels like it's a tool. I'm not saying, again, I, I, I have never said that there's a solution to all this. There are many solutions. There's a community solution. Um, I would say also that once you start using jail, in Kentucky, I would say the county that I focused on, three chapters in my book, you all can read it if you like. You can see what's, what's there. You, the amazing thing is that when, once you begin to reform jail, rethink jail, all of a sudden you begin to develop a constituency on the outside, too, for how the community needs to change to become a recovery-ready community so that people get out of jail and go into a situation where they are not set up to stumble and fall and fail. And that is what's amazing, too, is you find that constituency building, the reddest part of a red state, okay? That's where this is taking place, okay? This is not some, like, anomaly in the state of Kentucky. This is the reddest part. No Democrats have been elected in there for 30 years. I'm saying that this is all people who are coming, because it's their kids getting involved in all that stuff, they are coming to these new ideas about jail, about how to deal with it, and, 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 the same the quote you read, nobody's ever been, uh, 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 I can't remember what it was, f f treated against their will, that kind of thing. They're out there, their, their will is being displayed every single day in these tent encampments. And it's, it's not something that's killing them, you know, anyway. Okay, so it is 3.30. Um, uh, I did promise one last question. Okay, one if more. If you don't mind, Sam, um, and we'll just try and keep it very short. Yes, I'm thinking about the relatively ordinary, non-addictive personality, um, and I'm uh, thinking of the difference between emotional pain and physical pain, and how um, ordinary drugs can lead you, as you're trying to treat your physical pain, can lead you into um, some addiction. What do yes. you think about the kinds of drugs being offered through the hospitals and so on? You know, um, I didn't quite catch all that, but, but I would say that my first book, which is Dreamland, which was the book prior to this one, deals with a lot of that. that, that, that it, it got me thinking, because I didn't imagine any of this. When I started this book, I was a neophyte when it came to a lot of this stuff, and, and I began to realize that it was that impulse for not just magical, quick, easy, convenient solutions to complicated problems. It was our desire to avoid pain in whatever form pain might take. You know, could be physical, could be emotional, could be psychological, could be familial, whatever. And it, and it seemed to me that that was when I, as I was in the middle of re researching all this all over the country, it like was gradually dawning on me, oh my God, this is an enormous story and you're touching on it with your question. You know, we're, we're trying to find ways of ending pain, but pain cannot end. We need pain. We need some of it. We don't need some of the most excruciating pain, of course, but we do need, we can't just say, I don't want a life of, a life of pain. I'm going to do whatever I can to avoid it. That's what we've done for the last 40 years. Look at what it, where it got us. That's a short answer to what's a very, very complicated thing. Thanks very much. Okay, thank, thank you. you, everyone. Thanks so much. I'll be signing books. Sausalito by the Bay tent. Show your support for Sam. What, what's the name of the book? Sausalito by the Bay uh, books tent. Sausalito I think. by the Bay out there somewhere. Yes. Look forward to Thank meeting you, you all and talking Thanks further. for making time for a really compelling and hard topic. I appreciate it. And thank you to our interviewers.